Okay, you could sneak in a little bit closer and then um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll fill you in on what the rationale is behind the uh, fairly simple set of plots you see behind me. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Brian Barris. I'm a research scientist just up the road there, not at the jail on the other side that sometimes feels like jail, especially this year. But um, uh, so I work in the space of agronomy and cropping systems. And uh, I'm glad we've, we've kind of already initiated some of the conversation that, that's going to take place here as well. Um, and so what's the backdrop from, a, from an agronomist perspective uh, about these plots? Well, to give you some background, if we go back to about 2011, there was this global initiative that was established based on a G20 Ag Ministers meeting. And if you remember around that time, there were some food security scarcity issues. And and which is interesting given the cl climate we're currently in. But what, what you may not realize is there, there's a direct correlation between food scarcity, security issues, and uh, increase, increased deaths um, from violence, um, global uprisings, and all sorts of things. So one simple way as a, as a government, as far as your foreign policy goes, is to make food security not an issue. Um, and so they, the idea by, the, by this minister's meeting was to establish what's called the Wheat Initiative. And so most, most of the members of this Wheat Initiative are uh, from developed uh, regions, but there's also private um, companies involved and so on. I got another. I didn't think I'd, with my loud voice, need three mics, but uh, I'll just hold this thing. Um, yeah, I thought the t-shirt was. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, so 2011, we have this weed initiative. Every country can have two members on, for example, the, the research committee. There's three governing bodies to make a, a short story long. Um, so basically Canada was there with uh, Dr. Curtis Posniak, a wheat breeder, and uh, they needed a second member on there. And somehow I got nominated to be on that. And as soon as I got there for my first meeting, they also um, wanted to address another big problem that the weed initiative had, and that was they had no agronomy input at all. Um, and so I was roped into establishing and developing an expert working group. So the real important thing with the WEED initiative is they have these 10 expert working groups. Um, so these are your, your leading WEED researchers from all over the world, um, part of these working groups. And the whole idea is to try and bring together the, the WEED research community to address um, initiatives, research priorities um, that you know, each country actually finds themselves aligned to. And that's what's happened. We've, we've developed a strategic research agenda with the Wheat Initiative. What followed nationally was um, Cereals Canada developed and uh, worked with Ag Canada to develop a, a series of uh, priorities for wheat research in Canada. They align directly to the Wheat Initiative. So, so you, you may not think, what the hell is he talking about this thing for? Well, there's relevance down the pipe to, to where and, and ultimately where we want to focus, especially with our expert working group, is what's going on on your farm. And where that leads us to are plots like this and the whole idea around the concept of a yield gap. And so what we see um, is we see genetic gains by our breeders. They're making pretty decent progress. Um, we talked a little bit about that in Durham. I might have a differing view on where we're going with production, um, but generally speaking, we're making incremental increases in our genetic gain. The problem from a farm standpoint is do you think you're ever achieving anywhere close to the genetic gain of that latest, greatest variety? So for example, if that latest, greatest variety was giving you, let's say, um, 100, 100 bushels per acre, what do you think globally we're doing? How, how big do you think that gap is globally? What do you think between if that thing can top out at 100 bushels, where, where are we topping out at on the farm? 25. 25's one guess. Less than 50. Less than 50. Boy, got a lot of pessimists in this group today. <laughs> Any other guesses? Between 10 and 90. <laughs> <laughs> and now you know how Ken's managed to get as far as he has. He has answers that please everybody, huh? Nine tons a hectare. Nine tons a hectare. Well, we now have the most optimistic guy in the group here. Um, basically, it's 50% globally. 
um, which you know isn't isn't that great. Um, and then you all know about where those yields need to be by 2080 or even before that 2050 in order for us not to have an issue. The other thing we're facing with some countries like Australia that you know Australia is about they're better than that. They have some pretty good farmers and very elite agronomists out there. They're you know, on their best farms are probably pushing 70%. Um, but they've got a big problem. They are running out of water and their temperatures are increasing. And so for them, the production, the upward production is becoming a problem where they're trying to just maintain um, yield. So for us, what do you think you are on your farm? If it's globally 50%, what do you th think you guys are doing? 70. That's not a bad guess, I think. I think, so, so the question is, if we're, let's say we're 60, 70 or something like that. Our, our average right now, um, this is kind of a depressing statistic globally, but we're only moving at about 0.3% per year as far as moving production. Um, and the genetic gain, or, or not even the genetic gain, but the, the potential on farm is moving at a rate of about 0.6. So that's where you get that 50% yield gap roughly from. Um, but, you know, as far as 70%, that's probably not a bad guess. Um, the problem, though, is we don't know. Um, if you go to a thing called the Global Yield Gap Atlas, um, they have a lot of information on rice and corn and no information on, on, no meaningful information on wheat in North America, let alone Canada, let alone the prairies. And so um, we're trying to team up with um, some agronomists out of Kansas State and, uh, and Nebraska that have done some work in, in yield gap in those other crops and we're trying to work with them to maybe get something going on wheat. Um, and so how do, we, how do we start understanding the gap and where we can make some inroads? Um, and so this spring when we were talking about a potential for some demo plots and what was needed at a, at a field day here at Farming Smarter, this was kind of the concept that I came up with and we can, we can debate this um, this is, these are good conversation pieces, these plots here, because I'm, I know I'm going to get some pushback on some of this. So, um, which is good. That's kind of what I was trying to do. So, and speaking of provocative statements, I had to go to Berlin for the wheat initiative meetings. And so I said, well, if our yield gap is 50% globally, I think what we should do, and you have to remember, this is a group of all geneticists, genome guys, all doing this upstream molecular. I said, we need to immediately cease all of our work in upstream research and breeding for that matter, because we can't achieve those yields anyway, direct it all into agronomy until we close the yield gap. And you could have heard a pin drop in that room until I, I was like, I'm actually joking people, like work with me here. Um, but it was a good meeting. The outcome was that group is now moving in a direction where they see agronomy as a priority. So. Um, from two years ago, they didn't even understand what agronomy was, to be honest, and, and because they just don't work in that sphere. Um, so, so anyway, when we try and understand a yield gap on farm, what are the different things beside, that we have control over, right? Because one of, the, one of the things to take away from today is what we're trying to do as systems agronomists is really couple together the genetics with with the management aspect of it so we can either overcome the environment in which it's growing in or exploit it. Because um, sometimes there's an advantage to the environment you're growing in, sometimes usually there's not. Um, so water obviously is a big limiting factor um, which goes into it, but once you, once you eliminate some of those big factors, what are those on-farm things that work for you as far as coupling together genetics with management and so on? So if you take a look at these two plots here, this is kind of the scheme of what would be considered, and you can debate with me on, on how standard this practice is. Um, so for example, this is my standard practice plot. So what I'm using here, this would be in a situation where, you know, the farmer, he's just getting his seed kind of supplied by, you know, a local seed grower or something using older genetics. So these are all CWRS plots. Um, and the standard is using Superb that came out in 2000, 2001. Um, but, you know, was a bit of a breakthrough variety. So we don't want to cheat the system by having a low yielding one. Superb was a very good variety for its time and, and really moved the yield bar. Um, so what else are we doing here? We know and you've heard us promote a lot and advocate for the use of seed treatments, but in this case, still common to just use a fungicide seed treatment. Um, 
and uh, the seating area. We talked a lot about that. We'll debate that as we move over. But basically, when I was growing up as a kid, um, particularly my grandfather farmed in Fort McLeod and we farmed just down the road, but dry land wheat production, it was like three quarters of a bushel an acre. That's what guys were, were doing a lot of, and that was a wheat fallow system. Um, we obviously don't want you seeding at three quarters of a bushel. This 200 seeds um, is, is, is a bit higher than that, probably a bushel and a quarter, I believe, or somewhere around that, but still, yeah, basically, but still not enough. Um, but it's common, it's still common. And it was very, when I first started doing research, um, that, that was the common, and that was sort of the mindset we were, we were trying to like challenge whether or not that was the right setting. And then we've done work with nitrogen um, responses, and, and I see Ken Greer's here with Western Ag Innovation, so I'm gonna give him a plug in a second. But when it comes to nitrogen management, um, what do you need to be sufficient with respect to yield? Um, and really, a lot of the studies that we've done, and we know guys will, will push that nitrogen, but really just for yield sufficiency, assuming you've got some background in, you know, it's, it's hard to get responses beyond 60 kilograms of N in a dry land system. So that's, that's the rationale behind that. We've published work on that. If you want to start affecting protein, then you start moving up to about 90, that sort of thing. But really, um, you know, I, I am an advocate for soil testing, but I'm not a big believer that we've got good soil testing methodology in terms of the traditional, you know, zero to 60 centimeters, blah, blah, blah. What does that give you? Um, I think I think there's a state of evolution that needs to take place. And I think the PRS system that uh, Western Ag has, I think is, is something I'm a fan of as a, as a nice compromise between something fairly labor intensive and something that's not. Um, and then what did we do? Well, we just took some generic herbicides. I don't know what you guys settled in on um, as far as the farming smarter folks. And then one shot of a fungicide in crop Procero. So compare that to what I would say is a more intensified system, the plot on my left. So starting with genetics. So in this case, we're using a new release um, called Viewfield. And it's, it's, it, it, it has the potential to be a superb of its current time in terms of what its yield potential is. You'll see it's fairly short, um, very strong straw. So it's going to be able to withstand probably a lot of the production intensification that we throw at it. Um, seeding rate, 450 seeds per square meter. Um, so why did I choose that? Well, we've conducted studies and I see Brian Buckman's here. Um, so let's, let's take, start with the Durham example. Um, where does Durham have in terms of a response? Well, Durham is, you may know, has got a higher yield potential than a CWS for the most part. So back, way back in the day, 2006 to 2009, we were on Brian's farm with a sawfly study and it was actually wheat on wheat, but we had seeding rates of 150 to 450 seeds per square meter or divide that by 10 for seeds per square foot and with with an old variety like ac avonlea the durham we had positive yield responses through 450. Um, and and to be fair though you'll see that the, the the cws variety that we had was cdc go which for its time is a super high yielding um, variety still a good variety and uh, it also responded, was ticking up even through to the 450 rate. So the question is, why are we messing around with, with, um, with 200 when we're seeing responses to that? Because you guys have already talked about the advantages around uniformity that you see with a higher seeding rate, and that has positive um, uh, benefits for managing diseases like fusarium. Um, the big thing with a higher seeding rate is, and Ken talked about the tillering, um, more of an issue with CWS because Durham doesn't tiller nearly as much as a hexaploid wheat. Um, and so we want to get rid of as many of those tillers as we can. And the seeding rate is a very cheap, effective on-farm strategy to do that. You get it probably a shorter flower duration, definitely earlier harvest, shorter crop and so on. Um, so why else would we be advocating and why would a crop now be responding to that when maybe it didn't a generation ago? Well, the fact is that you have to use the example that they showed with hybrid corn production when it first came out. Um, and that was a long time ago. We're talking the dirty 30s and so on. But they saw no yield response with hybrid corn um, initially. 
Um, it was exactly the same as conventional. It wasn't until they started playing around with the management system that all of a sudden you started to see spikes in, in, um, in, in yield potential. And I, and I believe we're seeing that with the newer genetics as well. I mean, you've got much higher yield potential with view field um, to say something that was released 30 years ago. And so there's, there, there's, a, there's a pretty good um, hypothesis around that it would respond positively to a seeding rate and require actually that, that interplant competition because the other thing that it will do is you see a rapid decline in, in or a rapid increase in, in overall field mortality and that's what you want. You want to get rid of those runty seeds and runty plants that aren't going to amount to anything um, and that's why we, we like this one. Um, we bumped up the, um, the nitrogen rate on this one to 120 and then split it. So we're banding in 40 kilograms of N per hectare of nitrogen. And then we're going in at around FIGS 4 um, with an in-crop. Now, we've, we've been able to show quite convincingly with winter wheat that split applications are just as good as putting everything down at planting. Um, and we and spring wheat, the, the data is a little bit mixed on that as to whether or not there's much utility doing that. Um, so we're actually going forward with a proposal, uh, myself and Dr. Sherry Stridehorst, uh, with, with funding from, hopefully from uh, the Wheat Commissions of Alberta and Saskatchewan, but more importantly, we've got some um, stakeholders in the private sector as well that are interested in understanding how much or when is there a benefit to split applications outside of an of a operational logistics thing where you want to be managing your bulk a little differently. Um, so that's, that's the rationale behind that. Um, what, so what else could you do on farm to maybe bump up the intensification of that? Um, a dual fungicide insecticide seed treatment is something I strongly advocate for rather than just a fungicide only. Um, the neonic is a, is a hot debate right now. The reality though is in a seed treatment situation um, when it's going into the ground, um, the, the, the trouble I have with the debate is that that kind of, that kind of is being equated um, similarly to when neonics are um, applied in a foliar application. And um, that's just not the same thing. You're comparing apples to oranges. This to me has almost no downside to it as far as damaging beneficials. The upside is in the absence of and why I like to see that isn't because of the biotic factors that might be present in this plot like diseases or insects. I like the fungicide package with that insecticide because what it's done is it's altered the metabolic pathways in this plant now to where it's way more resistant to abiotic stress. So the cold, uh, the desiccating winds, just overall stress, um, way more vigor, way more, um, uh, more significantly more plants in the field as well as a result. So um, so it's, it's, it's definitely got its place and it definitely pays for itself. So hopefully you're doing that. Yeah. Do you use any ESN like to take care of this in-crop thing, this foliar? Well, we wouldn't recommend a polymer coated fertilizer like no, no, ESN. No, in the seed row instead of uh, the foliar later. Oh, as a, we, we, we're proposing some of that. Um, we've done some work in the past on that. Um, I, I love ESN for situations where you're going to be placing it in close proximity to your seed. There's no, there's no product out there that comes close to matching what it can do for you. If, if you're still one of those guys that are single shooting and, or at least having a lot of nitrogen near that seed run, it's, it's by far the only product to go with. And you can probably put down all the nitrogen you need because you're safe up to at least three times what you would be so if, so with a cereal you know you're at 30 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare you're kind of hitting a limit of of seed safety with with esn you could go 90 right on the seed and not have an issue and we've we've published a lot of work on that as well when you get outside that though the utility of going 100 percent esn um, falls to the wayside and we've worked with and published work where we've shown where a blend of 50-50 ESN with urea because seed safety is no longer uh, an issue is actually as effective and provides the same yield. And cost too. And what? It would cost too much if you did well, all ESN. 
Yeah, the reason you the reason you can justify that cost is the seed safety, and once it's no longer the issue, yeah, then then it doesn't really pencil out, especially at a hundred percent. There's there's some you know there's some talk of you know can we because of the slow release with ESN can we affect protein in a sideband situation and um, that data kind of has jumped around a little bit. Uh, we've seen it in some cases and it haven't in others. <clears throat> and then this one, what else have we done with this one? Well, this was kind of an afterthought because we were kind of planning this at the last minute. So it was like, well, what, else, what about the micros and stuff like that that you could, you could play around with to see if you could get a response? Um, and then the last thing we did is rather than just one shot of Procero, um, I think Randy, did you talk about that, about the utility of a second application? Maybe you could comment on that. Just, oh, if you come near me and... Okay, uh, one of the studies that uh, we've just, we finished a year or two ago, uh, growers were kind of asking what kind of leaf spot control would we get if we uh, didn't spray at flag leaf, which is generally the recommended timing, but we're gonna spray for fusarium anyway, are we gonna control our leaf spots? So we had uh, one application at each of those stages, uh, separately and then together. So we found, at least in, the, in Saskatchewan, uh, well, actually one of those sites was Lacombe too. Um, that really the benefic benefit we got from two applications uh, really didn't make economic sense. Uh, there was a marginally better uh, leaf spot control, uh, marginally increased yield, but it really didn't pay for itself in that term. That was uh, a Prozero and we also used just Tebiconazole or Folicure, so we used two different products. Um, so yeah, which would have been cheaper actually. Two more minutes, what I want to say too with that study is basically the fusarium timing uh, worked very well for our leaf spots. We didn't actually get much difference in yield. We did get better thousand kernel weight, so the seeds were nice and plump. Uh, and we're finding very similar results, at least in central Saskatchewan with stripe rust, when we put our fungicide on for stripe rust. We usually get our first calls from growers about late June. Uh, well, I've got stripe rust in my field, and so if they're spraying at uh, flowering, Basically, we're controlling, hopefully, or as much as we can control, fusarium with that application at first flower. Uh, we're also uh, doing pretty good on leaf spots, and we can control a stripe rust very well with a single application if you're growing a susceptible variety. So, sorry to steal your No, time. that's fine. I got a quick question for you. Well, you sure. guys are both there. That's awesome. I was going to ask you that question before, and now you're both up there. That's good. But is there going to be, if you're a heavy irrigated wheat crop, and you're going to... Yeah, I try not to spray unless I have to. And so protect the flag, protect the penultimate on yeah. your cereals. You get through the flag and you don't see any, we tend to see tan spot in our area for whatever reason, not the heavy fusarium area yet, knock on wood. <laughs> but if, is there, are we seeing much of a yield? I wondered that, is there a yield penalty to hold off? Hold <coughs> up, you get into early heading, you're still not seeing that tan spot. And then once you get maybe flowering, or even a hair past flowering, I start seeing that leaf disease, hit it with, yeah, go away from the strobe, hit it with the tebuconazole, is, I'm, we're gonna get, it seems like we're getting good results, but I wanted to see if I was shooting myself in the foot by doing that. I, I guess our question was, you know, do, do farmers, are they going to spray at flag leaf and then like a week later when it's uh, almost full flower, maybe 10 days later, sometimes even less, uh, we didn't see any benefit in our study. So I can't say every condition that's going to be the same. Uh, Ken and I talked, Ken Greer and I talked a little bit this morning that uh, we, ex we scientists sometimes extrapolate and say, you know, this is uh, the way it is, but there's always exceptions. But generally in our study, we didn't see a benefit of two, not an economic benefit of two applications. We found that the yield was the same whether we sprayed at flag leaf or fusarium head blight timing. We didn't have fusarium head blight to any great degree at all. So it was mainly leaf spots we were dealing with. We believe that yield, uh, if there was a benefit, because we did see a little bit less leaf spot control by delaying the spraying, but we got plumper seeds. So that probably made up for any little difference that uh, maybe a few of the shriveled seeds didn't make it. So at least in our study, no, I would recommend a single application. When you see those first anthers come out, so you're controlling your fusarium, you're gonna get some leaf spot control. And if you have a stripe rust year in central Saskatchewan, now down here, you guys probably get your stripe rust a bit earlier. So I don't want to speculate exactly if it would be the same here. We had two seeding dates in our stripe rust test. The late seeding date, the timing could be a little earlier than, than first flower. But again, it depended on variety. We have varieties of very good stripe rust. You don't need to spray for them, but uh, some of them you really do. 
So does beer get their Prozero information from you, Pete? <laughs> yeah. That's what they're claiming. Go later and it'll be better. I think Bear does a lot of their own work too. I, yeah. I don't think they're dependent on, on us totally, but I hope our results either confirm or raise some debate about what yeah. we should be doing. Okay, so what we can do now is, so then to test each one of these components, because we've got all the groceries in, this is a standard practice. What we do then is we'll take and we'll add each component individually to the standard practice or replace what we had as a standard practice with one of these more intensified. You can decide what's driving that or what's holding back that plot. Um, so for example, this one here, let's see if I get this right. So the only thing we've done differently with this one is we've just added the, now this has the dual fungicide and the insecticide. We're still using everything else, including the old genetics. Um, now with this one, and this is kind of interesting, we got some field variability here, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't take too much from that, but the other thing we can track on the genetics side to see how much of an influence we're having with genetics is, is the, at least the, the, the theory here, is we've got Superb back over here, and this is Stetler. So Stetler has Superb in its background, and then Viewfield has Stetler and Superb in its background. So, so we could kind of track and see how much influence we're getting on the genetic side as well. Um, and yeah, and then here's Viewfield with standard practice. Um, Wouldn't the seeding date have a massive effect? You know, it, it, it depends, and I think I don't know if you're aware, but we're trying to sort of do a rethink on on seeding dates with this a study. Was seeded, what, the first of June? Yeah, I think they didn't get it in until after that rain. Um, but would that? How much would that drive it as as compared to say nitrogen as an input or seeding rate? I would I would probably argue that. I mean, it's extremely important. That's why we're trying to get farmers to switch away from dates and just go to. As soon as you have two degrees in your top five centimeters, that's your trigger point to get out and start planting um, with wheat. And so what else do we want to see with that though? We want to see a high seeding rate, like around 400 at least. Um, and you can see the difference. So this is everything standard practice, still superb, but now we've jacked it up to, two, to, to more than double the seeding rate. And I think you can see probably a fairly positive difference between this and that first plot. <clears throat> And this is the split application. So we've upped the nitrogen with the old variety and old system and added in some uh, ammonium sulfate to this one as well. And again, standard practice, old genetics, and now some KCL thrown in, copper sulfate thrown in. Um, so what's going to matter? And, and what's going to matter is going to vary from year to year, but it's more the concept of understanding what, what each one individually will impact on your farm versus, versus just going out there and doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and assuming you've, you've got everything fixed as, as much as you can. And the takeaway from probably most of this would be that, yeah, nitrogen and seeding rate really drive the system. The genetics are an extremely important component to optimizing as much yield as possible. But we're probably getting to a point now where in these last, last two plots are just simply to see if we can create a water limited environment between these being water limited and these two not being water limited at all. Um, and so, you know, then you know, you'll, be, you'll be discussing things this afternoon like is there a role for PGRs within you know, within the economics of growing wheat across the prairies and so on. Um, seed singulation like Ken talked about, all that kind of stuff. Um, things that we need to start seeing if we can integrate to a higher level than we currently are. Yeah, Brian, do you have a question? So just looking at your, your plot here, oh. there's definitely a pattern right in the middle and it probably was a walkway at one time or something. Yeah, I don't know. You can definitely see a pattern down the middle. Of the Who do we blame for that, Ken? It's actually a straw row. Is that what it is? It's a straw roll. It might be. The residue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be present in the high end plot. So, is it in the high end plot? Or to a less it's degree? Less, it's Let's less see. present here than yeah. it is down there. So, it could you be. Can see it. Could so be. Brian. Yep. 
what kind of plant count at 450 seeds per square meter, what kind of actual live plant count are you getting? Like so, new variety? yeah, so good question. Um, how many plants should you have? Or what are you striving for with your CWS in your, how many plants per square foot, you agronomists that are out there, what are you telling your growers they should have? So I'll just turn it right back on you guys. 35. Ooh, oh, 30 35. To, 32 to 35 Thir up north. Okay, so, so what we generally see, we haven't done plant counts on this obviously, but uh, I can give you an extreme example from winter wheat because it's gonna be more prone to to uh, winter kill and so on. But if you seed at about 450, that would guarantee you um, easily in the range of 30 to 35 plants. And that's where we kind of want you to be with that crop emerging. And then if you lose some to whatever, predation, disease, whatever, you know, at a very, very minimum, you know, that threshold we want to see in at around 25. But we want to start and, and better yet, stay at 30 to 35, which is kind of a different rethink than say a generation ago. But this, these, these, this system and the genetics we have respond. Yeah, Brian. So if somebody's following the standard practices and they have an extra 10 bucks an acre to throw at their wheat, where are they gonna get the best return? Seeding rate. Yeah. Does anybody disagree with that? <laughs> I'm not looking for a fight. I'm just uh, wondering. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that would probably get you to not quite where we would still want to see it, but because um, you're going to be paying what right now per bushel? Uh, well, it's already treated, so it'd be the same. So it, it was. Would ten bucks a bushel be fair? Or is that too low? You're going to be low for, for yeah. especially if you're treating it. Because that was, that, and where, where's old Stat Manford? I always pick on him because this was actually a kind of a funny thing and, and, a, and a hard one to argue against because when we first did the seed treatment work, we were showing, you know, if, if you went and treated, and it was actually, it was a spring wheat study and it was actually 200 seeds per square meter um, that we were dealing. But we were showing that if you had naked seed at 400, like the high seeding rate, if you treated your, uh, your low seeding rate, the 200, 250 with the dual fungicide insecticide, you actually could get comparable yields. It wasn't as stable. Like if was, there's more variability from field to field. So old Stat Manford's like, well, why would I spend more money on seed? I can just put the seed treatment on. I get the same yield, save myself 20 bucks an acre. Remember that? <laughs> Which was kind of hard to argue. Thankfully I could show, yeah, you're right, but your variability from year to year, field to field, would be significantly worse off, um, which isn't something we can easily quantify through economics or any other way other than, you know, to show that, that, that that's costing you um, from year to year. Yeah? I got a quick question, Brian, about uh, seed row spacing, seed rates, and then across, uh, if you can wave a magic wand, start it out, it's gonna be a dry year versus a wet year. Uh, just to give people a frame of, you know, how you want to, how you want to think about that. Uh, what year, dry year, seeding rates. Um, so what we have found, and going back to Brian's farm that year, so let's let's use that as an example. So that was a fairly dry year. We're wheat on wheat. It's sandy soil, um, and even at a 450 seed per square meter, we were still seeing a positive yield response. So does that mean you're always gonna see a response at 450? Um, probably not. Uh, there's gonna be times where it levels off at 300, but the other, the other tangibles that, that, you know, are the, the whole thing about uniformity and weed competitive ability. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, you know, you know, manipulate your seeding rate too much based on, on what you anticipate for, um, for soil moisture pre precipitation patterns, but, if, if, if 450 is the sweet spot for winter wheat, then I think we could easily say, given you know, the dozens of site years we've now accumulated, f at least 400 for your, for your spring wheat would be the thing to target. Um, as far as the interaction with row spacing, 
we generally don't, believe it or not, really don't see a lot going on there until you really start stretching out beyond, say, 12 and start going like the 14, the 16. Then are you piling on too much into that one row versus something narrower? And then, yeah, I mean, probably. Um, and But, I mean, ideally, we would have it all spatially designed in a way where there was no dirt showing at all. It was all uniform, but obviously we can't do that. We're sort of moving in a direction like that with some of the work going on with some of these innovations around some of these newer drills and, and so on and seed singulation. But, but, but surprisingly, there's not big, big variances with seeding rate, or uh, sorry, with row spacing. Brian? Yep. Where do you start seeing, uh, you get response up to the 400, 450. Uh, where do you start seeing a penalty? How high do you have to go? Is there a bit of a room? Uh, cushion we can go 500 without actually hurting or yield. Ah, uh, good question. Um, it would it would it would vary a bit by site, but you know, the, in the old days, if you heard like my grandfather, the, you, there was a term called "hang off." If you ever heard of that one, and that was super droughty years that they were experiencing where you accumulated a lot of biomass, but you didn't get much. I think Brian showed me a nice picture, some almost some hanging off. Um, yeah. So, so the last time I saw it one year in one location in all my years of doing seeding rate, and that was in Bow Island. And that was on, again, that was wheat on wheat stubble. And that was at a rate of 500 with Lillian. Um, so I would say, I, I would say, you know, you're probably getting everything you need out of a out of a seed rate once you hit 450 with spring wheat. Um, we've we've played around with 600 with winter wheat and didn't really see much of a negative effect other than some lodging from a taller variety that you know obviously you you need to think about your genetics when you're going to push it that hard because um, even I think that's view field there one of these is view field we're pushing it pretty hard with lots of water lots of nitrogen. Um, it's a short, strong, straw variety. It's probably going to withstand that, but I would argue that, you know, superb's even short, but, you know, something a little bit taller might not do so well and start to flop around, or, you know, then you got to start thinking about would a PGR pay off and that sort of but thing. But you got to get pretty extreme. Like one of the uh, resistance uh, farmers have to seeding heavier is a little hurt it if it gets dry, but you got to go pretty extreme to get to that point, right? Yeah, I, like I say, I've, I've only seen it once as a, as, a direct, as a direct thing back to a seeding rate. Um, and that's, that's after uh, 20 years. It's funny, Brian, this spring on that field I was showing those pictures from, I'll bet you our mortality was over 50% in that field. Oh, yeah? Just, and today, like, it's the year we had, it's going to, the kernels will be good, but if it was that thick earlier, it, it's burnt right up, eh? Yeah. Yeah. And that, and we were talking about that too, about what, what's our average yield. What is our average yield, by the way, where are we, if we were, if I were to show you a chart tracking our upper end for yield over time, what do you think? How many bushels per acre are we at for a long-term average? Spring rate? Yeah. 60. Nope. 43. Because we, because we're, you know, the fact is, and it's kind of started with that study at your place when Superb was, I don't know what you're pulling off there. I think in, at worst, it was 60 bushels in places. And I mean, you know, your dad's generation, that was unheard of. And we, you know, we kind of, kind of enjoyed a wet cycle where we had probably high above average yields. And the data, when I quote 43, involves that old data as well, right? But still, we're at about average 43. And so, you know. Um, what does it take to get above that and how, 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 what can we do to stay above that? Because the other thing with these practices that we don't think about is the stability part of it. A system that's stable from year to year to year based on whatever that field is facing from year to year to year is what we're kind of after. So the more facets you build in, the more, the bigger and broader defense you have against all those abiotic and biotic factors. Must be closing in on lunch now, right? Yeah, it's good if you want to wrap up. Well, I don't want to hold you up for lunch, so I'm happy to throw this mic back. <laughs> yeah. All right, Stat Manford, hit it. So I did a piece of There's a strip trial last year, but I had 
say what it was, 250 seats per square meter, 350. <laughs> yeah. Um, a couple of fairly high fertility strips. Okay. I think I was 200 pounds actual end breaker. I don't do the metric stuff like the government guys. <laughs> and then I had one with like 250 pounds of actual end breaker. And I didn't see, it was on irrigation. And it was all topped out at about 115 bushels. So my so I put on 40 pounds actual P. Yeah. Do I need, like where am I? Where is my? What's the next thing that we need to bump up? Because nitrogen rates are up, seeding rates up. Potash on the soil test says it should be okay. Uh, boss, do we need to go? Do we need to be going to 60 pounds of actual P with our boss rates? Like where, where's our next big stumbling block? Well, I think if we're going to look for a big, you know, thing, big paradigm shift, I think you're kind of, that's kind of like looking for the holy grail. It's going to be, and, and agronomy can be boring that way. It's just the small incremental things. I know what you're saying about the nitrogen, and you kind of back up what I see. Like, if you take the EU, like, they're in even worse shape because they're being limited now on how much N they can put down. But then you've got countries that are subsidized, like India, that are literally putting down 500 kgs per hectare because they there's no downside to them that they see right and so they're pulling off some pretty big yields that way i mean what would what would it take to change it on your farm i mean if you could change the organic matter that you have um that was on a field that had irrigation right um it's going to be those small incremental things more diligent surveillance in the field to see what you have for biotic abiotic threats some of it's out of your control you know day length uh when did you plant it um, that's the next big thing we want to move it to is, is moving the synchrony of when we're doing our spring wheat away from some commonly held thoughts around what's the optimum planting date or, you know, all the planting dates are the same until I get past May 10th. Well, the response is actually very like crazy. Um, temperature extremes, rainfall, heat desiccation, all that stuff. So it's building the system with as many components that will withstand that. How's that for an answer? Did you do the economics on it, Matt? Fertilizer rate out, but so now, what about me just bumping the seed rate up to the half foot, or then you're pumping the fertilizer more? Yeah, and and that's that's why we got to not lose fact of the genetic component, right? Because once you get past four, even at four fifty, the genetics are are very important. Once you get beyond that, it's going to take a really really tailored genet set of genetics to like respond to that, then, but that's not to say it won't, um, either. Join me in thanking Brian. Thanks for the t-shirt, I just added it to my collection. My